Okay, there are a few seconds to go before we start. This is June 15, 2013, and the live session for the Moodle MOOC, the third week, uh, will start in uh, 10 seconds. This session will be moderated by Nellie Deutsch, and our speaker is Stephen Downs. Hello and welcome. Welcome everyone. Welcome to uh, our third session. And today is June 15, 2013. And welcome. If you could just write in the chat box where you're from. My name is Nellie Deutsch and our session today is about teaching and learning online. And our guest speaker is Stephen Downs, who's going to be speaking about connectivism, online learning, and the MOOC. So the Moodle MOOC is on its way. Um, hello, everyone. We've uh, had a really exciting uh, <laughs> two weeks. It's really been very, very intensive. And I think the key is, uh, from my perspective and from what I've seen, is actually the power of learning together. Those of you that are really, really involved and active uh, in the MOOC are uh, really appreciating and I keep getting feedback about the fact that uh, there is so much power. It's, uh, it's amazing how much learning you can get done when you do it with others, especially when it's uh, from around the globe. So if you could just add where you are, morning, noon, night, and where you happen to be in your um, study, in the living room, bedroom, by the ocean, or by the sea, or lake, and so on. Feel free to add that. Uh, I'm going to start with a bit of housekeeping. Um, Stephen, if you're in the house, if you could uh, raise your hand, only Stephen, for the time being. Um, and if you're not here, I'll repeat. Oh, I see a raised hand. Okay, that's very, very prompt. Okay, so Stephen's here. That's great. Okay, so I'll pass on the mic uh, in a second. I just want to go over um, the two weeks and what's coming ahead. Uh, the facilitators are all here, I believe. I'm not sure if Jason's here, but I think I saw everybody. Um, and welcome. The facilitators are doing a great job and so is everyone else. I wanted to highlight some things in The Power of Learning Together, uh, which Ludmilla wrote down. These are her words, and I think it's really powerful. First of all, it's teaching. Uh, the MOOC is about teaching with Moodle, not with other web technologies at this point. It is a Moodle MOOC, so it is about Moodle. I want you to keep that in mind. Um, and for the final week, actually, we will be talking about other things besides Moodle. So that's the time to do it in uh, week four. It's self-paced, but it's also time-based, which means that you either follow and are active or you're not. There are two means. One is the face-to-face -face and one is on the Moodle as well as on WizIQ. And um, what I think Stephen is going to be talking about and what I think you've noticed is from week three, You've been divided into teams so that it's active learning. Those of you who are not interested in active learning, reflection, sharing, and collaborating, there are other venues for you on the Moodle. There are lots of courses for those that are interested in other things and don't have the time and so on right now to be involved in active learning. Uh, there, were, there are four tasks. The task for week one, if you haven't done it, um, it's about asking questions and the KWHL and there's a place, this is a, an active uh, PowerPoint presentation. It's in the course courseware. You'll be able to click on these clickable areas, not right now in the, uh, uh, in the live session, but later on. Week two, uh, you also had to engage in creating engaging activities. So uh, that's a little bit for those who are interested in uh, learning as you do. Now what's ahead in week three and four? For week three, you're going to be doing less. You'll be able to continue working on tasks one and two, particularly task two, which is a bit heavy. And uh, you'll be creating a literature review on uh, effective 
learning and teaching online. Something to think about. In week four, of course, we're going to go beyond the MOOC and into other areas. That's where Glockster or uh, wherever you want to share with us, uh, you'll be learning about WizIQ and how you can add it to your Moodle. Okay, so that's week four. It's a practical week for everyone. And I think that's it. We're ready for Stephen. All right, so Stephen, your hand is up. So I'm going to pass on the mic. A little bit about our speaker for today. Um, I don't know uh, if, if Stephen needs an introduction, but if he does, just add in the chat box. Give me a thumbs up if you know Stephen or Smiley. And if you don't, give me a thumbs down or a non-smiley face. So those of you who know Stephen, thumbs up. Let's see uh, how many... Okay, here we go. Stephen, I'm passing on. <laughs> so, Stephen, uh, there's some hey. thumbs down, eh? All right, we'll have to get those I thumbs up. I can't see any thumbs oh, You can't see the chat? I don't see. You look great. You look as good as... I okay. can see the chat. See thumbs up or down. <laughs> uh, All right. Oh, there we go. Okay, I was at the top of the chat and I should have been at the bottom. All right. Okay. So, so welcome, welcome, Stephen. A little bit about Stephen for those who don't know. Stephen is a Canadian. Yay for Canada! And I think he's a very proud Canadian. One of the few that I sorry that I happen to know <laughs> uh, with a Canadian flag <laughs> uh, in his um, study. Is it Stephen? I think that's. Um, very hard That's my, You're what? It's my uh, my office. Yeah. Where the flag is. I think that's wonderful. Uh, right now I'm at I'm in uh, my living room, and so I'm afraid there's no flag here. <laughs> okay. Unless we get you one through the. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really, I should. I want to. Uh, I do enough presentations out of here. Okay, I'll get your presentation up in a second. Um, I'm sure you're curious where it is. A little bit about the presentation. Uh, you can read on it. I've highlighted some of the uh, concepts that will that Stephen will be uh, relating to, and that's connectivism, online learning, and the MOOC. Okay, so um, I think I'll get your uh, PowerPoint up, and we can get started. I love. Did you take that photo yourself? Yes. Uh, amazing. Yeah, it's uh, it's a Canada J, I think. Uh, it's from Lake Louise in Alberta. Yeah, I don't see much of a blue, eh? I guess that's the little blue that I see there. Uh, yeah, blue little... jays are, are a different bird. They're they're of the same family, but they're they're quite distinctly blue. Yeah. Uh, the Canada J. If this is one, I'm not positive that this is one, but it but it, it looks like one to yeah, me. Yeah, it does. It does to me too. Uh, the Canada Jays are generally uh, gray and black, like that, and uh, they're they're very bold. Uh, they will steal your food. Oh, really? Uh, they're really afraid of people a whole lot. But as you can see, they're they're really very nice. They they look great. I right. like them. Yeah, great photography. All right, and I noticed there was a camera in one of the rooms, uh, so I guess you're you're probably uh, a good photographer, or at least you like it from what I gathered. All right, so yeah. Stephen, um, you're going to speak about, um, you, do you want me to go through the slides, or would you like to do it yourself? I've given you writing tools so you can go through them. There's an arrow. Um, do you see it? It says next. I don't no. know. <laughs> you, don't, you don't see that? Uh, I'm sure. Uh, I guess keystrokes won't work. No. Uh, where is it? Looking, looking, looking. It's on the whiteboard on the top right. Just um, not that's too far. Yeah, just right. Okay. Here. You got it. Uh, I have a little you know, window pop up there. That was the problem. Oh, okay. And it was behind me. Okay, I got it. All right, I'm good. Okay, excellent. So, All right, so Stephen, I'll let you start, and um, and thank you for joining us again. Oh, my pleasure. So, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Downs, 
and I'm broadcasting from my living room in Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. And if you're wondering where Moncton is, it's on the east coast of Canada. So I'm not too far from the sea. I'm about 20 kilometers inland. Uh, and it's a nice summer day here, finally. <laughs> uh, we've had a lot of rain recently. I'm going to be talking for about 40 minutes on the uh, topic, as you can see on the screen, Connectivism, Online Learning, and the MOOC. Um, and uh, I apologize ahead of time for just talking for 40 minutes. Uh, next time I use the system, I'll figure out ahead of time how to make things a little bit more interactive. But of course, we will have time after I'm finished talking, and, and certainly I want to I want to limit the talk and what the interesting stuff is. Um, I'm hoping and assuming that uh, there's a recording being made, but if not, I'm recording it by audio. Uh, so there will be a record of this talk later on. And of course, my slides and my audio will be available on my website, and I'll make the link available to you at the end of the presentation. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, interestingly, Nelly pronounced this system as WizIQ. I've gone the last, I don't know how long, six, ten, whatever years, pronouncing it WiseIQ. So, it's interesting for me to hear a different pronunciation. It, it's fascinating how even something simple like the name of a conferencing tool, you can have two different perspectives like that. Uh, anyhow. So a quick overview, and then I'll launch into the uh, to the uh, bulk of the presentation. So I'm going to be talking about first of all about knowledge, uh, because when we think about the link between connectivism, online learning, and the MOOCs, basically this is the link between knowledge, learning, and community. So I'm going to be covering those three topics and trying to relate those three topics of the MOOC and back to also, uh, is my voice too loud? I could probably fix that. No, this yeah. is perfect, uh, Stephen. Uh, I think that if um, anyone finds it uh, loud, they'll have to go into the uh, audio settings of WizIQ. Just above your head there, there's a wrench. And lower the uh, bar, but your your volume is absolutely perfect. And I'm also recording this, by the way, through Camtasia, and I'll be uploading this to Vimeo and YouTube. Oh no, I think Stephen, everything okay? okay? Yep, I Good. just took a bit of the edge off the microphone. That might help a little bit of people. Uh, I'm hoping the sound is still okay. I didn't take a lot of the edge off. So. Uh, and so, I, yeah, and do keep commenting in the chat room. Um, is there a way of making that chat bigger? Oh, oh, um, that helps, I think. You can oh, pop it in, pop oh, it out. You can uh, pop it in. You can bring the, um, the attendee list. You can minimize it and bring it down so that you have a better view of the chat, Stephen. Um, well, I've, I've, popped, I've popped the chat out of its frame, and now I have a great big display of it. So Perfect. now I'll be able to follow the chat really well. So I do encourage you, everybody, to know I've got a great big version of it on my screen. It covers half the screen. <laughs> so um, I'll be able to respond to what you're saying as you say it. I won't respond to everything, obviously, because I've already seen how quickly you guys can cycle through chat messages but uh, I'll respond to the things that pop out in our salient. So the first part of the talk is on knowledge, as I mentioned. And then after that, I'll be looking at learning. I'll be introducing the so-called Downs theory of pedagogy. And I say so-called because it's too simple to be a theory, and it's probably, uh, probably certainly not original to me, but we'll leave that aside. And then after that, I'll be looking at aspects of community. And the overall view that I'm presenting here is that the connectivism and MOOCs, and for that matter, Moodle and 
wise IQ, I'm going to keep calling it that, are, are all aspects of this complex of these three interrelated uh, interactive elements, knowledge, learning, and community. And if there's a thesis here, it's the thesis that you can't take one of these things in isolation yet. You have to look at all three in order to understand understand you know the thinking behind the creation of things like MOOCs or even Moodle and and how we approach them in terms of pedagogy and design. So uh, I, I see interestingly uh, I don't I don't know if it's John or Jean saying knowledge is understanding. That's interesting. I wonder if if we'll see different perspectives. Maybe if you can type in the uh, chat area what you think knowledge is. I see uh, Cecilia saying knowledge is to be connected. Knowledge is power from Kristen. Knowledge is light from Amani. Uh, knowledge for me is the use of information from Nelly. Knowledge is what we get for behavioral change, a very pragmatic definition from Yona. Uh, knowledge is a base from Jason. You may have been reading Wittgenstein. Uh, Judith says knowledge is for sharing, Tamara, the accumulation of data, uh, Namrata, knowledge with action is wisdom, Harriet, knowledge without thought is labor lost, that's interesting. Uh, somewhere between information and wisdom, says Ryan, to be part of a community, says, uh, that's an interesting name, Bryony? Yeah, something like that, Bryony, I guess. Uh, knowledge is knowing what you don't know. That's it. Of thoughts and opinions about what knowledge is. Oh boy, I wish the arrow keys work. That's what I want to hit. A wide, wide range. And and a fascinating range. Now it says this is an international group. And, and you really see that reflected in the different approaches of different def definitions of knowledge, don't you? So let's begin, because we're educators, with a quick classification, because this wouldn't be an educational talk with, without us classifying things. Um, there we go. Sorry, I have a TV on silently behind me. It keeps distracting me, so I've just turned it off, because they, they've got dancing bears. And, never mind. <laughs> Uh, knowledge is the music of the spheres. That's pretty interesting. Um, historically, we've always talked about two types of knowledge. Uh, the original type of knowledge was qualitative. And this is the knowledge of Aristotle and Socrates and Plato. Knowledge that consists of properties, the, the natures of things, the qualities of things, uh, what sometimes might be called the essence and the accident. Uh, relations between things. This is the knowledge of, of categorical propositions all with the Enlightenment and, and philosophers like Leibniz and Descartes. We have really coming to the fore the idea that knowledge is quantitative. Knowledge is number, mass, proportion. Knowledge of the world is expressed in, in scientific principles. Force equals mass times acceleration. E equals mc squared. But I think there's a third type of knowledge that recently we've begun to understand and to add to this, and that's the connective kind of knowledge. It's the idea of knowledge as patterns, knowledge as networks, knowledge as causes and impacts. And it's this new type of knowledge that causes us to reflect on what we know and, and how we learn. So let, let me explore that a little bit more deeply. Let's think about the old way of looking at knowledge, the, the qualitative and quantitative way of looking at knowledge, and the new way of looking at knowledge. And we can create two perspectives or points of view here. The old way, and, and this is the old way, I mean, this isn't that old, it's what you were probably brought up on, is that knowledge is based on rules, knowledge is based on categories, knowledge is 
This is based on a series of facts, dates, um, etc. The new way of looking at knowledge categorizes a bunch of things that we might not even have thought of as knowledge, as types of knowledge. For example, similarities. Uh, you know, when when we say that two people look similar to each other, we're expressing a fact about those people. And it's a new kind of fact. It's not, you know, a, a person is six feet tall. It's not a person who has red hair. It's more of a pattern or resemblance. Similarly with coherences. Uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, recognizing symbols or faces or whatever in patterns of entities, again, we're detecting a new kind of knowledge. When you look at a face on a television screen, that's an example of this new kind of knowledge because what you're looking at is a pattern that you recognize as a face, but really it's created out of a series of dots, out of a series of uh, 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 little pixels on the screen. Uh, and Kristen lets us all know that uh, uh, she has red hair and is 5'9". So <laughs> very close to my definition of similarities or old knowledge. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. Um, in the new kind of knowledge, the knowledge isn't uh, something specific that we pull out of what we're seeing or what we're experiencing, like we would a number, like we would a quality, uh, but rather we say that the knowledge is in the pattern of what we're seeing. This takes a bit of explaining. And I keep going for that arrow key. Let, let me explain to you a concept known as emergence. And what emergence is, is the idea that from something complicated, something composed of many distinct parts, like a crowd or a swarm or a, a flock of birds or pixels on the TV screen, we look at that or in some way perceive it and pull out of that some sort of pattern. And if, if you've ever seen a flock of birds flying in the air, you've experienced this phenomenon, right? Uh, in Canada, we have geese that fly south every fall and north every winter. And when we look up at the geese, we see a distinctive V formation. Now, there isn't actually a V in the air. All there are are geese. And the V that we see isn't made up of little Vs, it's made up of geese, right? But we see the V, and this pattern that we see is what we would call emergent from the individual phenomenon. Oh, Renato says, are we going to write on the whiteboard today? I didn't know you could write on the whiteboard. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, but Gordana says no whiteboard mess today, I hope. That's interesting. Um, and and <laughs> I, I see we have very strong opinions about the whiteboard. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm doing okay with the chat for now, and I'm thinking this is kind of pretty good at the moment, but if I feel the need, we'll go to the whiteboard. So what's interesting about emergence and, and what really matters to me is that something that is emergent isn't in the phenomena itself. Rather, something that's emergent is something that requires a perceiver. It requires a person to look at that phenomena or look at that phenomenon and recognize, oh, that's a V. Or, oh, that's a face of Richard Nixon on the television. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is, again, there's, there's no place where the emergent phenomenon actually is. If you, again, think of the V composed of geese, right? There's no place where the V is, right? It's not in any particular goose. It's not even in the sky particularly. The V is 
what we would call distributed. It is distributed across a set of geese. If we look at a picture of Richard Nixon on the television, again, we're not seeing a whole bunch of little Richard Nixons that make one big Richard Nixon. We're seeing a whole bunch of individual pixels which we recognize as Richard Nixon. There is no Richard Nixon in the pixels. Richard Nixon is not inside the TV. Uh, you, you could not simply send a message to the TV saying, show a picture of Richard Nixon. Uh, you, you have to, the receiver has to know um, or be able to recognize what's on the screen. As Jason said, gestalt. Uh, it's related to chaos theory, but I'm not going there with, with this presentation. Uh, gestalt is, is a much better example of this. Here, here's how it works on, on a more physical level. Um, here's how emergence ties into human perception. On the left-hand side, you see a picture of a tree, right? Um, but now, when we perceive a tree, we don't have little trees in our head, do we? That would be absurd, right? When somebody says to us the sentence, Paris is the capital of France, we don't have a little sentence in our head. Right? All we have in our head are neurons, individual cells that are connected to each other. And our perception of a tree is basically the connections. I'm assuming you can see this cursor. Uh, the, the connections between the individual neurons. When we see, so I see Nellie's, and so I guess that means she's demonstrating to me that you can see mine. Okay, good enough. Oh, no cursor. Uh, do you see the cursor when I move it? Uh, maybe not. No, not. Um, Stephen, it's maybe right only there. Nellie's cursor? Yeah, it's my I cursor, but your cursor should have your name on it. It's just above. Do you see where it says pointer? To your left, there there are the uh, oh. writing tools. I think you got it. There's a pointer there in a different color than oh. mine. Pointer there in a different color than yours. Well, I mean, uh, usually they're different. If you just go to the left uh, on the left, whiteboard, yeah. there's uh, there are icons on the left. Oh, there we go. You got okay, it. Got you it. got a red one. That's so, nice. Yeah, not well, red works. <laughs> All right. So there we go. So, and I hope it disappears when I'm not moving it because it'll always be very distracting. But, or maybe it doesn't. Maybe I have to turn it on. No matter. Anyhow, um, you can so where you got it. You can see what happens here, right? Uh, our experience of a tree. Oh, I'm getting applause for pointing. <laughs> That's different. Uh, our actual experience of a tree. Our, our, our conscious awareness of seeing a tree is, in fact, the activation of these connections between individual neurons in our mind. And when we recognize a tree, what's happening is we're presented with a visual phenomenon, and these connections are being activated and because these connections are similar to other sets of connections, it's, it's like all of a sudden these neurons, this distributed representation, like a picture of Richard Nixon, is activated and you go, oh, a tree. Um, and so that's how we experience a tree. That is what our knowledge of a tree is when we think of the connective knowledge of the tree that we have. Now, what's really interesting is the relationship between the tree and our mental state, right? Do we say that our mental state stands for the tree? Well, not really. Um, you know, we, we don't have this, this sort of representation in our mind like a model or a construction that we build to represent the tree. It's more like we have a mental state that is 
caused by the tree. And, and over time, as we have similar mental states that are caused by trees, we just kind of get more and more comfortable with our recognition of trees. And anytime we see a tree, it's sort of like this mental state is activated and you go, oh yeah, okay, I get that. And that's what knowledge is. Now what's interesting about this form of knowledge is that, of course, it's distributed, but it's also non-atomic and it's, uh, it's if you will, sub-symbolic. Uh, it's like Marshall McLuhan's idea of the media is the message, says Nelly. Yes, and I do have some presentations drawing that sort of connection. What's really interesting is if you represent knowledge this way, you get a very efficient system of representing knowledge. Take a look at this. Same set of neurons and the same set of connections can be used to, to recognize and remember the recognitions of different things all, ta all taken together. So a tree is just as we saw it before, but when we see this little puppy, we see something different. We see uh, the blue lines and that set of pattern of connectivity between the blue lines is what gets activated when we see the puppy and over time this pattern of blue lines is our knowledge of puppies or at the very least young dogs. No idea whose puppy it is. It's, it's just a Google image. Uh, I'm not sure why I brought that. If we see a picture of a couch, again, we have a set of connections between neurons. And in this case, we have the green neurons. The green web is activated. So on the same set of interconnected neurons, we have the tree, and we have the puppy, and if I had a third hand, I'd layer it, we have the couch. So what's really interesting is Although they're not semantically related at all, the pattern of connectivity related to a tree has an impact on the pattern of connectivity related to a couch. This is how you can get these associations sometimes that, that seem to make no sense, right? And make no logical sense. And I'm sure you're familiar with with many of them. Uh, you hear a song, you remember an old girlfriend or boyfriend, right? Uh, that's a non-semantic association, but what's happening here is uh, your memories of the girlfriend and your memories of the song are taking place in the same neural net and many of the same connections between neurons are activated when you think of one or the other. Uh, when you think of a cause and effects, the reason why you think of an effect every time you think of the cause is because the same set of neurons and the same set of connections that are activated when you think of the cause is activated when you think of the effect. Now, they're not exactly the same. They're, they're only overlapping or, or similar, right? We, we have a similar set of connectivity. And the similarity is, is based on a wide variety of factors, but the effect is when you think of the one thing, you think of the other. As Hume would say, it becomes like a custom or a habit. It's just a habitual thing. It's something that grows in your mind over time as you experience cause followed by effect. Um, Stephen, can we get this PowerPoint as a PowerPoint? Yes, this PowerPoint is available or will be available uh, shortly after the presentation on my website. So definitely you can get this. Um, okay, moving on. I saw it yesterday. You did? How could you have? I only made it yesterday. <laughs> uh, but there, it just, you know, this, this presentation is composed of slides that I've used in other presentations. So, yeah, you didn't get something completely original for this talk. I'm sorry. Um, anyhow, moving on. Yes, smells are representations also. Except, are they representations? Or are they, rather, reflections of the experience that you've had? 
there's, there's a difference between a representation and what we might call a reflection, right? A representation is like a sign or a symbol that stands for something. But a reflection has, uh, a, a reflection is more like an echo, a mirror, or an image, or uh, an event, or, or uh, you know, uh, a result of uh, what we experience. Um, Decald says, memory plays tricks on our mind. What we perceive is often determined by what we remember what we remember and that's quite right and the explanation for that is every time we have a perception our perception goes into this network of connected neurons and then what happens is the pattern that already exists that is most similar to our perception becomes active and so we actually see what we remember as well as what's actually in front of us. We, we, we don't just learn and know things by recognizing, we actually perceive. Perception itself is a process of recognition. Um, okay, let me move on. I love this conversation. Uh, how is this different from traditional theories? And if you're in Moodle, uh, you, you've probably been steeped in constructivist theories of learning. Uh, in traditionalist theories, the meaning of something is the state of affairs being represented or described. Uh, and you know, you have this this whole mythology about making meaning and all of that. Uh, but on this theory, it's not. Let's think about things like redness or seventeen or the power law. Uh, these concepts are, are actually nothing more than the organization of low-level, non-meaningful entities. These concepts are nothing more than the connections between these neurons that are caused by repeated perceptions of similar phenomena. So on the connectivist theory of learning, Knowing or knowledge is very much based on the organization of ourselves, the organization of the connections between our neurons. But this allows us to say that knowledge more generally is the organization of something. And this is what ties connectivism as a learning theory into things like social network theory and graph theory and mathematics. And we can identify various types of knowledge based on the sorts of things that are organized. And so we have, and we've observed this, two very distinct types of knowledge. Personal knowledge, which is knowledge that you have and I have, which is the organization of neurons in our brain. And there's also public knowledge, which is the organization of artifacts, such as papers, uh, houses, bricks, streets, uh, etc., uh, laws, books, contents of books uh, in a public environment. A lot of the time people say, well, knowledge is all about this public knowledge. Knowledge is completely 100% social. Knowledge is influenced by the social. What we see and recognize in public knowledge can be reflected in personal knowledge uh, and vice versa, but the two are distinct. What links them together is a common underlying logic, graph theory, connectionism in computer science, social network theory, for example. And it's our understanding of this common underlying logic that gives us our understanding of what not simply what knowledge is, but also what learning is, which takes us logically to the next step. And I'm running way behind on my time. I'm so sorry, Nelly. <laughs> uh, I get distracted. Crystal saying what Stephen is talking about is also why digital literacy is so important and there is a gap in students. You know, that's so true. Um, there's, 
how, how do I want to phrase it? There, there's different ways of looking at the world, and no problem we can extend the time. Well, I'm sure everybody's never mind. Uh, there's, you know, you have people out there. No, bad way of putting it. There's two ways people learn about the world, and one way is that the world is a set of facts and a set of principles and all of that. It's your, your you know, public school for the masses way of looking at the world. But then there's another way of looking at the world which understands that it's, it's patterns and resemblances and similarities and relations and all of that. And there's a critical awareness that comes with that understanding. And this talk is way too short even with extensions to get into that a whole lot. But these two very different ways of looking at the world are really very distinct kinds of literacy. And if you don't have this, this pattern way of looking at the world, there's an important way in which you, you simply are not understanding what it is that you're seeing. Uh, Stephen, we are a dedicated group of people who stay here as long as you have the time. Okay. <laughs> it's handy that it's a Saturday. Uh, all right. Well, I'm getting lots of feedback here. So, moving into learning then. What is learning? Learning, specifically, if we want to get technical about it, is the way we form connections between these individual entities, like neurons. Uh, you know, it's funny, people say, you know, is connectivism a learning theory? I say, well, no, not really. It's a theory about learning. But learning theories, properly so called, are the theories that describe how we form these connections. If your theory does not tell you how you form these connections, it is not a learning theory. And if you go back and you analyze, actually think about behaviorism, cognitivism, constructivism, and you ask, do they tell you actually how these connections are formed? The answer to that it ends up being no. It turns out to be a black box. I don't know if you can see what my cat has just joined me. Hi, Alex. Say hello to the world, Alex. <laughs> uh, you should certainly see the tail. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, good enough. Um, see, Nelly's cat is called Median. No, that's an average name. Uh, uh, so, um, I'm not sure what you mean, uh, Crystal. I think it was that said schemata theory. Um, anyhow. Uh, there are different learning theories. There's a whole domain uh, of computer science or cognitive science based on um, learning theories. So I've put up just a few very simple learning theories on the screen. Heavy in associationism, backpropagation, and Boltzmann mechanisms. And, and I like these because uh, they they resonate. They uh, they're, they're learning theories that have actual implications that you might be pretty familiar with. Um, for example, Hebbian and associationism. This is the theory that was brought up by Donald O. Hebb, Canadian, I might add, who uh, was a psychologist, and the theory is very simply. Uh, if you have two neurons that are activated at the same time and are not activated at the same time, then a connection will tend be to, to form between those two neurons. Uh, or, you know, to put it more uh, generically, like attracts like. Uh, things that are similar tend to be related. And this is the sort of learning that you see in society all the time, right? Uh, you see associations formed between people who have similar political views, we call those political parties. Um, and it's, the, it's you know, the social instantiation of a Hebbian sort of uh, learning theory. 
back propagation is, is a technical concept. It comes from uh, computer science uh, and, and specifically the, uh, the computer science of connectionism as, in, uh, as explained by people like Rummel, Rummelhart and McClellan. And basically it's the idea that you have a set of connections between neurons. My fingers interweaved represent sets of connections between neurons. And you, you send some input into that connection that alters the state slightly and you get some output. And then from that output, you have an external response which either accepts that output or corrects that output. If you're correcting that output, you send a signal back into the network and in a sense it undoes the changes it made. Uh, back propagation basically is the concept of feedback. Feedback into a network can alter the, uh, the state of connection between entities in the network. And so this is, again, something that we're very familiar with, that we recognize a lot. The, the whole idea that, that feedback, uh, reflection on what we've learned, reflection on what we do, is a way of adjusting and correcting our knowledge. Nothing unusual about that, but there is a physical mechanism and a computational mechanism that describes it. I'm going to get the cat in the picture here. He's certainly going to be, be present throughout. <laughs> He's not going anywhere. I don't know if any other people who do their presentations with their cats, but I do because uh, that's just the way my cat is. Um, the, a third type of mechanism is what are called Boltzmann mechanisms. Uh, these are actually put based on the principles of dynamics. And it's the idea that if you unsettle a series of connected entities, that they will eventually settle into a stable kinetic state. A good example of that is uh, you throw a rock into a pond, and that creates great disruption. But ultimately, the pond will settle back into its most stable configuration, which is flat water. So the same thing happens in the brain. You give the brain an experience, you give the brain an experience, and it disrupts it. But then it kind of settles into place. Um, and what's interesting is the more you do this, it settles into different places, and eventually, you know, it settles into the the most stable possible configuration. So it's the idea that new experiences, disruption, and diversity uh, create the sort of agitation that we need in order to, in order to form the most uh, kinetically stable set of connections. So these are you know, these are but three learning theories. Uh, there's a whole domain of learning theories. There's just uh, a huge, huge literature on this subject, especially in computer science. Um, uh, okay, I'm not sure what Nelly is saying. Why is IQ offered you a premium account? Why don't you use it? Sorry, it was, was on my mouse. To use it. That was on the wrong mouse. Is that mouse? addressed to me? No, 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 no. I was on the wrong mouse. I've got two computers open. I use the wrong mouse. No, I, I wanted to get the link in. Forget it. I need one mouse for two computers, uh, not two mice. For, I get you. Yeah, got me. Okay, sorry, I apologize. Right. So, Nelly's multitasking. Nelly got caught, multi, got caught multitasking. <laughs> uh, I, I, I laugh because I do it too. So, and Nelly's heard this all before. Uh, I'm sure she has. So, that leads us to the ridiculously simple. Downs theory of pedagogy. And the Downs theory of pedagogy is based on this idea of knowledge, and it's based on this idea that learning theories are theories of how these connections are formed between networks, and consequently, the Downs theory of pedagogy, if we could call it that, which we really probably shouldn't, because somebody else probably came up with it first, is very simply this. To teach is to model and demonstrate. So you know, create the experience. 
That's what you need to do in order to actually kick off these patterns, right? No learning without experience. You, know, you don't just make it up. You have to experience stuff. And if you experience a certain kind of thing, you will learn about that thing. Really simple pedagogy. And then to learn is to practice and reflect. We need to practice because that's how we're going to produce this output, which will generate the feedback. And we need to reflect. Reflection is a combination of receiving this feedback, but it's also a combination of this settling out. You know, and you need this settling out time. Uh, you need this settling out process. You know, that's why people meditate. Uh, I don't meditate because I, I'm way too disorganized for that. But but many people do, and the value of it is is you're giving your brain a chance to just kind of settle. But I, I do other things. I cycle a lot. I take my photographs. You know, my, my photographs are kind of like practice, but they're, they're mostly about reflection. That's my, my simple thing. Um, how can this be connected, asks Teresa, to foreign language learning? Great question. And the answer is, the answer, anytime somebody says the answer is, they're, they're, not being honest with you because there's never a simple answer. But think about language learning. You need language speakers and you need examples of the written word, etc., in order to learn uh, You know, there's a lot of language learning that simply proceeds by teaching you the vocabulary, teaching you the principles of the grammar. And I've gone through years of that kind of training. And what I've discovered is you don't learn language from that. What you learn language from is examples of the language in practice. So when I really started to learn French, um, although I found a grammar book useful, I found the local daily French newspaper even more useful. And I worked with an instructor who basically conversed with me and would reflect back and, and discuss things in French with me. And then my own learning, right? You can't just sit there and receive this information. You don't learn a language that way. You have to practice the language. Uh, on doit parler en français. Si on parle en français, on, uh, on va uh, apprendre la langue, right? You have to practice it. And, and you, you see even there how I was a little uh, hesitant uh, searching for words and that it's the practice that, that, that reinforces these connections, that livelies up these connections so that the next week in French, it's there, the word is there. But you can't just practice. I've seen people practice French poorly for many years, and all you get out of that is learning French poorly. You need reflection, you need response, you need feedback, you need to hear people correct what you've said, uh, but you also need to listen to your own conversation of French. I do some talks in French. I listen to them after to hear myself speaking in French and to thereby correct myself. You know, athletes do this a lot. They'll, uh, they'll look at a video recording of their performance and see what they need to correct, and then they'll go back out to the field and, and try it again. Perfection is not an accident. Absolutely right. Perfection is mostly, mostly practice. So, um, when to correct and when not to correct. There isn't a rule, Jerry. It's, uh, you know, there, there isn't a rule. You do the thing, whatever it is, you experience the response, then you do the thing again. And it's a gradual iterative refinement of the correct of the uh, connections between neurons in your mind you, you can't go in and say okay well I'm going to correct my patterns of connectivity in my mind today and tomorrow I'll take the day off it's not how it works um, so yeah it, it's a really really simple pedagogy and and the other aspect of the pedagogy that isn't here in the diagram is uh, there, there's no shortcuts here. There, there's no simple tricks. You know, uh, there, there's no magical way of doing it. 
our knowledge is a set of connections between neurons and the way we change that set of connections is we grow connections it's like growing muscles it's the same it's exactly the same kind of thing it's the same kind of process um uh, ryan i have a whole presentation called uh against uh digital research methodologies um and the scientific method testing hypothesis this is one of these rationalizations after the fact that people make of uh, the uh, process of discovery and inference. Uh, and, and my own approach is based on people like Paul Feyerabend, um whose uh, theory of science could be summed up essentially as whatever works. bells because I didn't figure everybody needed the bells. So uh, Judith asks, is this written anywhere in an article or a book perhaps? If you go to my website, which again I'll give you the link at the end of the uh, slides here, you'll find tons of articles, presentations from which I've borrowed for this one, uh, and a set of ebooks, which are really just collections of my articles. There isn't you know, a simple 100 page Angry Young Man book. Uh, but I'd like to produce one uh, at some point, if I ever get the time. So let's take the theory and actually apply it to learning, practically so-called. Now let's think about how we're going about doing this process of learning. And what we're doing in a connectivist MOOC-type course is we're, we're creating and working with a network of connected individuals and also a network of connected resources. There's this whole um, a whole philosophy called Stigmergy, S-C-I-G-M-Y-R-G-Y, -E I forget how you spell it, uh, which is the idea of communicating with each other using artifacts. Uh, when ants build an anthill, uh, they're engaged in a process of Stigmergy. One ant uses an artifact, whether it be a piece of sand or, or a pheromone, a bit of scent, uh, to communicate with another. I'm not very good at pronouncing words sometimes. Um, so we're using this network, but we understand as learners as well as teachers that what we're trying to do is create this set of connections, and specifically the synapses, between neurons. Uh, this, this process, when it happens in the human brain, is called plasticity. Um, I read a, a book a long time ago called, uh, called Scientific Realism and the Plasticity of Mind by Paul Churchland, uh, who introduced me to the concept. Uh, there's been a lot of research recently that shows that even adults uh, their, their, the connections between their neurons change. Uh, you know, they, they, uh, they grow. It's not simply that connections form and uh, cease to exist, but also they strengthen and weaken. So it's not simply a connective relationship. It's the strength and weakness of connection between individual neurons. Uh, you know, do what you're putting in his brain muscles. You know, I mean, it's not literally a muscle. But, you know, uh, the analogy is so strong that, that it really works. If you don't lose it, if you don't use it, you lose it. There's, there's certainly an element of that. But there's all kinds of ways of using it, which is really handy. Language learning. One of the things they tell you in language learning is to think in the language uh, that you're trying to learn. And that's a way of using it. That's why they tell you that, right, to think in the language. I always wondered what that meant. But then I realized it's just, you know, how when, when you think to yourself and you hear yourself talking, just do that in French. And, and, and if you're doing that, you're using the language, even though all you're doing is thinking of it. Pensez en français, exactement, vraiment. You do that in Chinese, very good. I would do that in Chinese, except I can't. 
Uh, there seems a nice fit with accelerated learner, Gardner and Rose, and personal learning concept. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Gardner's gotten a lot of bad press, especially recently, uh, but I think there's an awful lot of overlap there. Uh, <laughs> the first time I dreamt in Spanish and realized it, I was so proud of myself. You know, Nancy, I had that exact experience, except in French. And it was uh, the night before I was going to give my first ever presentation in French. And so I've been really working on this really hard because you know, there's a lot of pressure there. And the night before, I'm in the hotel in Edmonston, and I dreamed in French. And I woke up, and I realized, I'm going to nail this. <laughs> uh, we all self-talked. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, next slide. So here, here is the muscle analogy, right? Developing personal knowledge is more like exercising than like input. Uh, it's more like it, it's more like exercising than inputting, absorbing, or remembering. You know, people people talk about learning as though learning is remembering. Learning isn't remembering. Uh, remembering is like just the, the tip of the iceberg. You know, go back to this slide. Okay? If learning is remembering, then I remember the tree. But it isn't just remembering. When I experience the tree, it impacts my perception of the dog and my perception of the couch. Learning is so much more than remembering. This is why, you know, you, you get a lot of this fact-based type of learning. You know, like focus on the facts. Get people, get students to concentrate. Your recall is better if you eliminate distractions and all of that. I'm sure you've read all of that literature. I guess the cat's gone. I can turn the uh, camera back up again. Oh, whatever. There we go. Um, but the more you focus on a single fact, the less of this overlap effect you have with other knowledge, other experiences that you might have, right? Uh, the more you focus on a single thing, the less what you've learned about that single thing can help you learn about other things. If I learn about a hat, right, that should help me learn about keys. I don't know how. It's all in the connections. There's no simple way of saying it. But if I focus on nothing but hats, 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 that doesn't help me learn about keys at all. And, you know, these experiments where they, they have you focus on hats, refocus on hats, and then they give you a test on hats, well, yeah, you're going to perform better on hats. But you'll be terrible at keys, right? So when we're evaluating learning, if we simply evaluate for the fact, then what we're doing is actually constructing a mechanism of evaluating that misrepresents what learning is. Learning about a hat isn't simply remembering things about the hat. Learning about the hat is learning about the hat in a whole wide range of experiences. So we have, you know, uh, bits of knowledge like hats support keys, right? If you don't bring keys into the picture, you never learn that. Okay, I don't know if that was a good analogy, but there it is. Um, higher order thinking skills. I have a whole presentation called Speaking in Lolcats, L-O-L-C-A-T-S, that talks about that. Um, because the nature of higher order thinking skills itself is impacted by this discussion of learning. So. We're building our learning muscles. So that takes us to evaluation. Well, if we're not going to evaluate people on what they remember about hacks, how do we evaluate them at all? Well, let's think about what we've done. We've created one of these networks, this set of connections between individual neurons in the mind. We've created some personal knowledge. This personal knowledge will be reflected in our overall behavior in the network of people with whom we interact. We recognize a person's knowledge by their performance in the community. 
what we do when we do tests is, is we identify a very narrow bit of performance, very focused on a particular subject and say, ah, we're going we're to evaluate your knowledge on hats, right? We'll give you a test about hats. But really, we know if a person knows about hats, if they use the word hat properly, if they wear a hat on their head and not on their knee, um, if uh, they observe common social uh, uh, conventions about hats, like taking them off when they go indoors, uh, etc. There's a whole bunch of things that we know about hats that we would never be on the test, but people interacting with us in a community will be able to see as a whole set of discrete events, right, and then they will recognize as an emergent phenomenon, oh, this person knows about hats. How do you know that I know anything about learning? Uh, I've actually never been tested on the subject. I never have. It's never come up. Um, my credentials are in philosophy, not education. What you have is a whole series of data points. My writings, my interactions, the conversations I have here with you in person, on Twitter, whatever. And the totality of those data points is like the set of pixels on a TV screen. And when you look at that totality, you recognize, oh, this guy knows what he's talking about with respect to learning. Or maybe you don't, right? Not everybody agrees that I know what I'm talking about. That's because people recognize things differently. And that's good. Uh, because we want there to be a diversity of opinion about whether or not Stephen Downs actually knows what he's talking about about learning. And then these people who think I do and these people who think I don't can talk and interact and they learn about each other. And overall, all of society develops a better theory of learning. And if you think about it now, it's not even about whether I convince you that I'm right. It's about me giving you a set of experiences, you respond to those set of experiences, you recognize this, that, the other thing in that set of experiences, and then interact with other people. And that whole process of interaction produces social or public knowledge, and it also, in you, produces personal knowledge. Your knowledge isn't just an echo or a copy or a transmission received of something I said, your knowledge based on what I've said is the overall set of connections you form in your mind by listening to me, by talking in this chat room, etc. I've kind of missed some of the uh, chat, and I'm sorry about that, but I got carried away. That happens to you sometimes. So, what is a personal learning environment in this context? Well, simply, a personal learning environment is a tool intended to allow you to immerse yourself in this community, this community in which you will perform, this community with which you will interact in order to learn, and this community which contains individuals who can recognize your learning and which as a whole will be able to recognize whether or not you learned or not learned. Love Cormier's image there. I don't have Cormier's image there. Oh well, I must be referring to something else. Uh, I'd come back, okay. No one talks about emotions and connectivism. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point. And, and at some point, I should probably do the emotions talk. Um, yeah. But this isn't the time for it. I'd have to think about it more. Uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect discusses that people cannot recognize whether what they know is correct or incorrect. Yeah, uh, that, that's, that's a really interesting point. I've seen people defend vehemently points where they have no possible way of being able to tell whether or not, whether or not they're right or wrong. You know, so even the fact that they defend their beliefs to the death 
doesn't mean that they are able to know whether or not they're true or not true. This is one of the interesting ironies of human cognition. I think we should do that, Stephen, next time. Yeah, well, but I have to think about that, too, for a while. Uh, okay, moving on. I mean, I don't have a ready-made theory of connectivism and emotions. So here's how we set up the first moot. And the first moot actually did include a Moodle. You can sort of see the square edges of it up in this upper left-hand corner. The, uh, you know, we'll start here, proceed through the course, and everybody will remember this stuff. But we move way beyond that because what we were trying to do in a connectivist course was not to take a bunch of facts and present them to people so that they could remember them, but rather was instead to create this environment, this social network of interacting people and objects and artifacts in which a person could enter, immerse him or herself in the discussion, get these experiences from other people, not just from the teachers, although uh, George and I engaged in modeling and demonstrating, not instructing, modeling and demonstrating. The, what the instructor in a connectivist course does basically is goes into this environment and then performs their ordinary work. So what George and I did at CCK08 is we went into the environment, we talked about connectivism, uh, we listened to some presentations by experts on connectivism. Um, you know, we just did our normal day-to-day -day activities. We engaged in this process ourselves and then invited other people along for the ride so they could see what we do and interact with us as we do it. And the idea here is to create this environment in which other people can see this happening and then start to practice it for themselves. And that's exactly what happened in the course. We know the course was a success because people started practicing and reflecting. Did they learn the content? Well, there wasn't content to learn, right? There was content, but we used that content as a catalyst, as a way of getting this network going rather than as something that needed to be memorized. And I look at the people who were in that course, and I looked at them a number of years later, and I think, I'm thinking of names like Francis Bell and Sufi John Mack and Jenny McNess and a bunch of others. There's a whole bunch of others. And I look at the work they've done since they were in that course, right? And I, I, I see all their behavior, all their posts, the, their papers, many of them have, have published papers, their interactions and all of that. And I say, yeah, they learned. How do I know they learn? Because I look at their performance in the network and I recognize that they got it. That doesn't mean they understand connectivism the way I understand connectivism. Certainly not. Some of them are very critical of it and think it's a stupid theory. But that doesn't matter. What matters is I can see by the way they use the words, by the way they present the topics, by the way they discuss things that they got it. And there isn't, you know, a simple yes-no kind of test to say, you know, if you pass this test, you got it, and you didn't pass this test, you didn't get it. It's not that kind of thing. It's what Wittgenstein would call a family resemblance, right? It's, it's this whole concept of similarity. When I look at them behave in the network, there's enough resemblance with what I think of as connectivism to say, yes, they learned connectivism. Um, I like this, Amani saying, I liked my own mind map because it's the only one I understand very true. Every person on earth is wired differently. And not just a little differently, really dramatically differently. Yeah, there are some similarities. Um, but, you know, you can really mess with those similarities even. Uh, you know, everybody has a visual cortex and they process their visual images pretty much in the same way. But... And there were some horrible experiments with kittens, and I'm very sorry to report this, but they did this, where they sighed, they, they sewed the kittens' eyes shut and then examined how their visual cortex grew. And their visual cortex grew differently because the kitten wasn't seeing out of the eye that was sewn shut. Your, your actual 
neural connections wire themselves differently based on what's coming in. I know, what a terrible, isn't that a terrible experiment? It's awful. And, and that's one of the nice ones they did. They did some really nasty stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm glad they got that. I, I would like to think they've got that all behind us. I'm not sure they don't. Um, so they also, I mean, they've done stuff like that on humans too. Like they used to do things like slice the corpus callosum. Uh, it was an experimental procedure separating the two brain halves. Uh, and so there's, there's a whole bunch of things. That's where the emotions come in. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Can you believe a piece of knowledge that you received out of an experiment that you know was morally reprehensible? An interesting question. So here's how we set up individual personal learning environments in a network, right? So this network of individual PLEs is actually the working part of a MOOCs. You know, it's the part where all of you are out there using your own systems, your own software, you're on the web, you're on mobile, you're on a desktop, and you're interacting with each other with some central registries, and this is where the MOOCs are, right? Uh, maybe with some PDP, direct person-to-person -person communication. So this is the actual technical structure of one of these networks of personal learning environments. Uh, we can believe, but not applaud. Yep, good enough. Um, but I, I do wonder whether there's, there's an actual epistemic effect. So if you think about how you learn, and again, I have a whole presentation um, on uh, personal professional development. You're, you're working with your own neural net, your own set of connections, your own individual brain muscles, to use the analogy, and your own set of connections with other people because everybody has it. You know, it's like everybody has their wire, branch are wired differently, but everybody has a different set of friends and connections out there in the world. In fact, if you don't, you live in a very small town and have serious, serious social issues going on. Um, so it becomes most important that any individual manage their own personal professional development, uh, that they use, that they manage their own learning. There's this phrase in English, I don't really like it because I don't like dog food, but the phrase in English, eat your own dog food. Uh, in other words, and the idea here is that if you reflect on how you, as a professional, learn, then and, and reflect on how best to learn. These are the practices you should use to teach yourself, but also over time, these are the practices that you should use in order to help other people learn. And you notice that's what I do, right? Uh, it's what you know. I'm a researcher. I, I do my work in this field, but really what I do in order to learn about online learning is I form and create and work with these networks of other professionals like Nelly, um, etc. Crystal is asking, wondering if there is research that links multilingualism to the higher efficiency in PLEs. I have never seen any such research. Um, but you know, you kind of figure. Right? Because people who are multilingual are going to be getting uh, experiences from other people of different languages, and other people of different languages uh, give you very diverse uh, experiences, and diverse experiences produce, in my mind, better learning. But I haven't seen any such research. That would be a major research project. Thank you very much, Imani. I appreciate the nice, quick, big red comment. Uh, okay. And, and there's the link, of course, to personal pro professional development. And there's a lot to think about even there. And that takes us to the last bit, community. Because community is really these learning environments that we're trying to create. 
uh, community is these networks of individuals. Sometimes people talk about community as well, you can slice it and dice it. You know, you have Morocco, and you have Libya, and you have Tunisia. Oh, yeah, nice, nice communities. But we know that communities are a lot more complex and a lot more multi-level than that. Uh, there's a community of dark players. There's a community of cat aficionados. There's a community of Canadians living in New Brunswick. There's a community of Venezuelans living in Caracas. Uh, there's the community of English-speaking people in Caracas. Uh, there's the community of people with red hair um, who might be connected or might not be connected. It's sort of hard to tell. Uh, there's the community of people who are teachers. There is, there's the community of people who hate teachers. Um, all of these are kinds of communities. All of these are networks into which we can immerse ourselves to networks we can join and participate within in order to learn. And, yeah, and, and we have here the community of violet colored people. Yes. <laughs> so let's make the statement right off the bat about what education is and what democracy is. Um, Education is not about remembering a body of predefined content. Seymour Papert said it, Paolo Freire said it, Freire describes that as the banking theory, they banked a bunch of knowledge. Education is not about remembering a body of predefined content. It is about the citizens of the community communicating what they know with each other. And you can think right off the bat, well, there's all kinds of conditions to make that happen, right? Uh, and somebody has immediately jumped on OER. So it follows, oh, it should say it follows, not if follows, sorry about that. It follows that open educational resources are necessary for this democratic vision of education. Because if your content is closed, if the words and concepts that you use to communicate are closed, you can't communicate. How can I share the word key with you if Apple owns the word key and would charge me money every time I used it? I couldn't do it. In my Speaking of Lolcat presentation, I talked about how we communicate with each other, not just in words, but with a wide variety of things, with, with words, actions, gestures, with sets of rules, with principles, with logical systems, mathematics, with maps and diagrams and images, with pictures, pictures of cats, pictures of cats with little uh, quotations on it, uh, with pieces of software, with, uh, with text, uh, with uh, actual physical objects, like when you send a present to your mother, you're communicating with there's all of these forms of communication. And what makes communication possible is the open and free exchange of those things with which we communicate. You know, there's a, there's a, a disease called Alzheimer's disease, which is actually a, a disease that impairs cognitive function and memory. And what it does is basically it blocks the communications from one neuron to the other neuron. When you block the communication from one entity to another entity in a network, you eliminate its capacity to experience, to learn, and to grow. And that is the philosophical argument, the, the, the argument based on learning and knowledge for open educational resources and indeed open resources in general. We need as a community to have the right to use the words we use to communicate with each other. Otherwise, no communication is possible. Otherwise, no knowledge is possible. And therefore, the right and proper owners of education are the citizens of a society which actually do the talking and communicating with each other. What does that mean in practice? 
What that means in practice is a network-based approach as opposed to a group-based approach. Now, notice I've put the words collaboration and cooperation up here. We hear a lot about how collaboration is necessary in education. I actually reject this. Remember our Schwartz? Yes, absolutely, definitely. Um, I argue that in learning we should be focused on cooperation. That is playing nice with each other as opposed to collaboration, which is playing in a group. See the difference? All right. There are different elements that typify what I would call groups as compared to networks. Uh, a group is all about unity. Everybody should be on the same page. Everybody should say the same, uh, speak the same language. Everybody should learn the same thing. We should all unite under the same vision statement. Uh, our society is a melting pot. Go with the flow, get with the program etc. But a functioning learning network is based on diversity. It's based on distinct individuals interacting with each other. In collaboration, it's all about leadership. There's so much stuff on leadership and education. I just want, I just want to scream. <laughs> Which is it's all about you know how leaders define group value, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, manage learning, blah blah blah. But we already know that a person needs to be in charge of their own. Life. They need to be autonomous, uh, just direct themselves, and and we know that because each person's learning experience is different. Groups are closed. You're in or you're out. But learning should be about openness. It's about bridges and connections. Collaboration is about distributed knowledge, sort of distributive knowledge. I need to be careful. That was a bad choice of words there. But what I mean by that is knowledge that is owned by an expert and then distributed in identical copies to each person. So everybody has exactly the same knowledge that the expert had. But really, knowledge is connective. Knowledge isn't created by distributing copies of it to each and every person. Knowledge is created by each and every person interacting from a different, distinct point of view. And then the knowledge emerges from that network as a whole. These, yes, are the X MOOCs, the, the collaboration group, unity, coordination, closed, etc. These are the MOOCs that are created by Coursera and edX and all of that. But the C MOOCs that we've been working on are based on cooperation. They are based on these principles of autonomy, diversity, openness, and connectivity or interactivity. So I call this principle the semantic principle. It's a design principle in the sense that uh, you should be using these as principles for learning system design. And so when George and I designed the initial first uh, connectivist course, and certainly when I was building software for it, these were the four principles that guided us. Right? How do we help people be autonomous and use their own software, their own systems, etc.? How do we encourage a diversity of point of view, but not just diversity of point of view, diversity of languages, diversity of educational software that people use, diversity of communications channels. So we, we enable uh, Second Life, we enable instant messaging, we enable Google Groups, we enable blogs and RSS and all the rest of it. Openness, key defining principle of our courses. But they were open not simply because we had some sort of vague generalized notion of oh, open is good. It was open because 
a learning system must be a system that can experience from outside. It must be a system that can produce behaviors, actions, practice from which there will be some sort of reflection. Openness is what makes it possible for our learning system that we're constructing to learn. And then interactivity. Uh, our learning was not based on the expert speaking the truth. Um, our learning was based on people like George and me going in there and doing what we're doing and then people coming along for the ride, interacting. Call it adios. Oh, interesting. Autonomy, diversity, openness. You spell it, you know, you got the words in the wrong order, but semantic. Isn't that interesting? Autonomy, diversity, interactivity, openness, semantic, adios. Hmm. See what a perception from a different linguistic perception or perspective will give you? I never thought of that. I don't know if I want to call it adios, though. I mean, that seems so final. Uh, okay, so uh, these next four slides simply expand a bit on the, the concepts autonomy. And, and then, again, there are many types of autonomy. I've got a link to a whole paper on autonomy. Um, diversity, and I've, I've, dealt, I've done diversity so much over the years, and you know, we, we could talk about diversity. There's a whole argument um, relating diversity and power laws, diversity and influence, um, diversity and uh, and, and uh, uh, preservation from cascade phenomena. Uh, you know, when when a society becomes uh, under the influence of, of a single voice, uh, that society has become very dysfunctional and, and becomes maladaptive and eventually dead. Uh, and, and it's diversity that uh, is the response to this. Uh, and, you know, there are different aspects of diversity as well. One of the links here is to a paper I did with Daniel Lemire examining in some detail the mathematics of diversity. Lumiere is a mathematical uh, genius. Uh, certainly compared to me, he is. I don't know what other mathematicians think of him, but I think he really knows his stuff. Um, more on diversity, you've heard of, uh, I think it's Robert Putnam and uh, Richard Florida and all the rest of it. There's a, a whole discussion I've done on homophily, you know, because it seems almost like a contradiction. Remember I said one of the learning principles is the head heavy in learning principle, like attracts like. That seems to be the opposite of diversity, doesn't it? So maybe we shouldn't encourage that. Well, we should. Uh, it's still okay. But we need an explanation. So I provided a bit of an explanation here. Um, should we teach what we have in common instead of our differences? Well, no. Teach both, right? Uh, similarities are important. Uh, you know, they're how we form communities. Uh, but differences are important as well. They're how we learn. Uh, I've talked so much about openness over the years. I don't want to linger on this. But again, there's many ways, many ways of talking about openness. Um, you know, there's... You know, you're talking about open education. It might mean open content, open teaching, open assessment, open admission. There's a, a presentation, uh, a whole presentation by, uh, oh, darn, what's his name now? He's at the University of Southern Queensland. I have Don S. Davis in my mind, but that's the guy who plays the general in uh, Stargate. Uh, that'll come back to me. Um, there's open networks. Here's a, this diagram here on the right is a diagram of our MOOCs, right? And you notice that there isn't really a defining line. You, you can sort of say there are some people in the MOOC, those are the ones in blue, and some people outside the MOOC, those are the ones in green. But that border isn't really a border, is it? Uh, you know, and it's simply... We look at this diagram and we recognize, oh yeah, there's kind of a core there. Different people would make the core different. But you know, there's no right place to be in this network. You can be way out here, or you can be right here. All of those are fine. Um, 
And then, of course, we have the openness of open educational resources. And I talked about this before. Open educational resources become the means of communication. They enable people to pursue their own interests in their own way. We need to pers we need to view them not as resources created by publishers, but as things that we, as learners in the society, create to interact with each other. There's a whole industry out there based on taking stuff we created it, packaging it, and then selling it back to us, right? And I am so not interested in that whole industry. I am interested in this idea of resources that we create as individuals, as academics, as researchers, as practitioners. We create these things and we use them to talk back and forth to each other. And things that block this flow are things that make it harder for our society to learn. That, um, and I really thank you for all of your patience is pretty much my presentation. We have, at the very end, interactivity, and there's the whole, there's the whole discussion of influence versus emergence. And again, I have a link to that. Um, scope versus level. Uh, there's an ontology of emergence. Uh, you know, what is the status of objects that we recognize? There's the, you know, that face of Jesus on Mars. People may have seen it. It's basically it's shadows on a mountain. Uh, but when you look at the shadows on a mountain, if your brain is constructed in a certain way, or if more accurately, right, if your brain has grown in a certain way, you look at those shadows and say, Jesus, I see Jesus. I look at those shadows and I go, oh, yeah, John Lennon. Uh, you know, um, you know the, the Jesus on toast phenomenon, exactly. You know, why, why don't people see yeah, you know, Lou Costello on toast. Why doesn't that happen? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that many people do see Lou Costello on toast. They just don't report it. But the question, what is the ontology of Jesus on Mars? Does Jesus on Mars exist in any real sense? Uh, or is Jesus on Mars simply a perceptual creation? Well, if everything we see in the world is processed in this way, in the same way we perceive Jesus and Mars, what's the ontology of this key? Interesting. Really interesting question. Uh, somebody mentioned complexity, chaos theory. There is a connection to all of this, and I'm not going to talk about it at all. I'm sorry. That's my office at work. That's my little Canadian flag in my office at work. The uh, URL in blue is my website where you can see all of my writings, and I mean literally all of my writings, well, except the stuff I did before the internet. Uh, I'll have to put that online one day. Um, this presentation will be available um, on that website probably sometime today. And uh, yeah, that's all I've got to say. But I'm more than happy. Uh, you guys showed me a lot of, of patience. More than happy to take any comments, questions, etc. So, Nelly, back over to you. Well, thank you, Stephen. Oh, can you I turn on my recording? Yeah, thank oh, you. Yes, no, I you're did. fine. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was uh, undescribable. It was amazing. Um, you can see the um, the reaction in the chat box. You can also, by the way, everybody, you can copy the chat and take it with you, but you can also do that when you're watching the recording. Stephen, don't go away. We've got a little surprise. Okay, uh, a final something or other uh, as our to show our appreciation for everyone and for staying. So don't go away. Uh, Jace, if you could raise your hand. Jace has raised his hand. No, he hasn't. Jace, if you could uh, please raise your hand. We've got a little something here that we'd like um, you to, to experience because this is what it's about. I mean, that's what I got out of it. Uh, experiencing and Jason is going to have us experience. So, okay, there we see Jason. Um, and let's see, Jace, can everybody um, see Jace? 
It's a little dark here. <laughs> oh, you're in the dark, my friend. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, let me see if I can. It's a, it's a little dark here today. Let's see. That's okay. We're, we're, we're visual. We Is can okay? imagine things. Is it okay? To... <laughs> yeah, that's a little better, maybe? I don't know. Hang that's on. okay. As long as we hear you. Um, that's right. You don't need to see me. No, no. We need to hear you. We need it. Yes. <laughs> How about hearing? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. yeah? The mic's really up? well. The mic's up. Oh, Everything's okay. working well. Uh, get your thumbs up there, people. If you can hear Jason, thumbs down. Well, if you can't, you're not going to get your thumb down. But okay, there we go. You know what? Give me one second. I'm going to get. I'm going to get some lights. One second. That was a flash. Did you see how fast he went? Oh my gosh, that was really, really fast. Is that Jason or is that your son? Looks like your son's out there. Hello. Hello, sweetie. Oh, is... <laughs> Sorry. That's here, okay. Here All right, everybody, get your, um, your muscles ready. We're going to do some exercises. Yes, gymnastics. Yeah, Jace does look like a gymnast, doesn't he, um, Amani? He does, yes. Jace, are you going to do a little bit of stunts here? Is that is that a little better? Hang on, let's see. Yeah, here. you're you're fine, dear. You're just you're doing great. No problem. All right. Now you look. Yeah. Now we see you're wearing a, right. a green top. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. I think you can see there's some uh, headphones on there or something. Yeah. Yeah. We've got there we've we go. got the Canadian flag right. and we're in New Jersey with Jason R. Levine. So um, let's give uh, and, uh, I'm a big also, clap. Also known Thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do, everybody, is I'd like to put on some music, and I'd like to hear some comments in the chat box, and I'm going to put the comments into the rap. So anything about MOOCs, connectedism, about, about Stephen Downs, the Downs theory, about what you heard today, anything about MOOCs, anything about community building, uh, anything you want to say, where you live, where you're from, I'm going to throw it in, do a freestyle rap for you. Let me put on some music. I think uh, Dr. Nelly really liked this one the last time, so I'm going to try to find that one again. And she likes to do the doctor, the Dr. N, or the Dr. Nelly. Let me just get it right up here. All right, one momento. Okay, let's try this. And you got to tell me about the levels here. If that's too loud or not, can you hear the music? It's okay? Perfect. Yo, mooks sound like moo moo. Someone said moo moo. Like a cow goes moo or mooks like cows. I tell you how I'm gonna put the freestyle rap down. If you give me something to say, sound one Puerto Rico in the house. Where are the neurons in the mooc? Talk about neurons and keep on engaging. I'm getting enraged when I see ex mooks not really about me. Block us from Mexico, emerging Ryan. And awesome, who's from Pennsylvania? Connections, it's all about protecting our self interest as a group community. Down with the mooks, why he make it happen? Sam, I don't know where you're from, but some of these people like Dr. N, I know where she is, but it's kind of a mystery. Keto Ecuador, that's Marie Soul, Maria Soul, my bad. Oh, we are, we're going so far with the open educational resources. That's what we got, we got it, and we're going fast like horses, feet galloping down the path together in any weather. That's right, helping each other. Who's cute and lovely? <laughs> I got thrown off, but practicing reflection again, the reflection, the connection, the intellectual pondering, and everybody get profound, getting deep, helping each other. Things that are lasting. Dr. L, and where is the dancing? Not feeling this beat. Oh, she's feeling it now, but the chat box gone. What did I do? Now I can't see it. I didn't change anything. Dr. Nelly, did you mess with my settings? I can't see anybody's chat. All I see is you and Steven's library. I can't get very...
scary into rapping when I can't see the chat box. Can you help me out? I need you right now. A lot, cause I can't see it anymore. Where's the chat box, Nelly? Nelly, it's what there. you do with my chat box? There. Where is my chat box? It's there. Oh, wait. Ooh. No, it's not. Yes, it is. I don't see it anymore. Oh. It's no. there. Oh, there it is. It just came back. <laughs> I popped it back. I popped it up. I can't really do anything. Getting thirsty, sipping out my cup. Down to the left. I know, but when you're rapping, it's like you're bereft of any neuron connectivity. Right lower corner, got it. Oh, there's Michelle. Elle est en France. Je peux parler en français, no en anglais. I rap today because I'm not bilingual when I rap for you. 40 degrees here, Jerry. Where are you? Nelly rocks. That's right. Without socks, without shoes. I'm doing it. I don't sing the blues. I rap. Tell me something more about education, because I'm here to help you. All our dedication and devotion together. We create emotion. Motion, that's a good M for a move. Cool and when is out. Not good air at all. Oh no. Macedonia. Yeah, Scopia in the house. Yeah, I know every capital because I built my knowledge base. And my name is Jace. Fluency of CC's Ryan, Kevin, and Tokyo. Reflections about representation, don't you know? Greetings from the Middle East in education. I tell you, it's a big celebration. We get connected in research triangle, North Carolina. Do how you do it. Low hit, my man, I know you're following me. I'm Wiz IQ. I tell you, there is so much we could do. Greetings from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Where else? Venezuela, my man, are you in Caracas? Intelligence in Greece, Elena, you know, I got peace when I'm with my family. I'm always like you, cause I feel good in Israel and Egypt. Middle East represented today. Crystal Brody from so many places in the Midwest, but actually from Germany. You love me in Egypt and London, love you too. And I love Portugal. The king, thank you. Global citizens, peace, it's all about that. Where are you in the house? There we go. Thank you so much. <laughs> wow. That's the Dr. Nelly and Pussy Show. All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can go on. I can do this all day. So Thank that just has you. to do with our schedule here. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Thank you I think we've much. gone over almost uh, two hours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining, Jason. I'll let you out there. Uh, have a great day, everyone. It's a Saturday. Uh, enjoy it. Enjoy it with your family. As Jay says, peace and how do you do it? Jay, your peace thing. Peace, peace and much respect. Yeah, right. Do that. Global family. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Jay. Class is closing. It'll be on YouTube. Long, but it'll be on YouTube. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Bye. Bye-bye.